Well, welcome to Morning Manna. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, prior to the Christmas holiday week, I talked about things you can do in the last days. And I'm going to resume where I left off before the holiday break. I'll call this week's series End Time Preppers. In those December 2017 editions of Morning Manna, I talked about Matthew 24. It's the most well-known chapter in the Bible about the last days. The disciples asked Jesus what would be the sign of the end of the world and his return. They asked him, tell us, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus gave a long answer about the end of the world and his second coming. The entire 24th chapter of Matthew details his response. Now, most people think Jesus stopped talking about the end of the world at the conclusion of chapter 24. He didn't say the conclusion of chapter 24. Now we begin chapter 25. All of chapter 25 is about the end of the world, the last days and Jesus' second coming. His response to their question about the sign of his coming and the end of the world covers two entire chapters of the gospel according to St. Matthew, Matthew 24 and 25. Now, the first thing Jesus said is don't allow anybody to hoodwink you. He said, take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now, I think all of us including myself, have misinterpreted what Jesus meant when he said, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. The popular interpretation is that many false messiahs will appear in the last days, each claiming to be Jesus. Now, I'm going to give you an alternative interpretation. First, Christ is not Jesus's last name. Joseph and Mary were not Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Christ. Christ means anointed. Jesus Christ simply means Jesus, who is the anointed one, the anointed one sent by God. Jesus said that many will come in his name and say, I am the Christ. I think he meant many people will appear in Christian churches and say, I have come here to this church in the name of Jesus. Listen to me. I am anointed by God. Jesus said, beware. They will deceive you. Jesus gave the disciples a long list of things that will happen in the last days. You know the list, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilences in many places, the persecution of Christians, the betrayal of Christians, cold, heartless humanity. Basically, he said, hey, guys, listen, this is only the beginning. This is the beginning of sorrows. It's going to get a lot worse before I return. In fact, it's going to get so bad that God the Father will be compelled to pull the plug on the human race because no flesh on earth, human or animal, will survive the things that will be happening just before I return. Now, when I return, introduced this morning manna theme to you in December. I said that I had come to the conclusion that we Christians spend far too much time thinking and talking about things over which we have no control. All of those last day events are going to happen, whether you like it or not. We have no influence over any of them. We can't slow these things down. We can't lessen or mitigate their impact. We can't delay or stop anything on Jesus' list of last day events. We can, however, and we must obey him in the remainder of what he said in Matthew 24 and in all of Matthew 25. And that's what I'm going to be talking about this week. 99% of most Bible lessons and sermons about the last days are focused on escaping 
the things coming upon the earth. That's why so many people believe in a secret pre-tribulation rapture. They just want to get out of here before those things happen. Yet nowhere did Jesus assure his disciples that his sheep will escape these things. The emphasis should be on Matthew 24, verse 44. Therefore, you also must be ready for in an hour when you least expect the Son of Man is coming. That's it right there. Therefore, you must be ready. Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, both are entirely about being ready for the last days in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something. This is going to be a shock to you. It's about your money. Now, before you get all worked up into a frenzy because I said it's about your money, please understand that God, your Father, is not trying to take your money. My friend, God, your Father, is trying to get money to you. Matthew 24 and 25 is about the church. And if it's about the church, that's about you and me. And it's about the church, you and me, spending lots of money telling people that Jesus is Lord and that he's coming soon to rule his everlasting kingdom. Let's read Matthew 24, verses 45 through 51. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has made ruler over his household to give them food at the appointed time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master delays his coming and begins to strike his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not look for him in an hour he is not aware of and will cut him in pieces and point him his Appoint him his portion with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the King James Version says to give them meat in due season. This faithful servant gives them meat in due season. Food represents spiritual nourishment in the Bible. Jesus said that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. Furthermore, his flesh and blood served in the Eucharistic meal of the Lord's Supper is the superfood we must all consume in order to have life. John 6, verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. John 6, 54, Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, was Jesus referring to roast beef and mashed potatoes when he said that we, we must serve meat in due season? No, he was referring to the word of God and the bread of heaven, his flesh and blood. Essentially, Jesus said that the faithful and wise servant who is ready for his return, is the person who is serving the right spiritual meal at the right time, the appointed time. Now, there's a message that must go out to the world's population in the last days. And Revelation 14 gives us some of the ingredients in that last day's meal that the church must serve on its table. There's an angel flying in the midst of heaven, who has the eternal gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth in every nation and tribe. The angel cries out with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Therefore, the message of the first angel is a call to the return of the fear of the Lord and to worship him as the creator of the universe. Now, worshiping God as the creator requires people to disavow and denounce Darwinism, evolution. Let me ask this question, and maybe you're one of these people. 
How many public school teachers who teach science and biology or college professors who confess Christianity, how many of you are willing to publicly disavow Darwinism and evolution and publicly teach creationism? Are you willing to do it? That first angel says, fear God, worship the creator. Every time you teach evolution in school or college, you're disavowing God the creator. The second angel shouts that Babylon has fallen. Why has she fallen? Babylon has fallen because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her sexual immorality. That's enough said right there, isn't it? The third angel shouts with a loud voice, a warning to not worship the beast in his image, nor receive the mark of the beast on his forehead or on his hand. Such a person shall drink the wine of the wrath of God and perish in the lake of fire forever. The last day's dinner served by the church must also include a heaping helping of holiness, separation from the world. I said last month that we are commissioned by Jesus to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God in all nations, making disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus told us to hold banquets and invite people who cannot pay to attend and are financially unable to reciprocate by inviting us to a banquet feast. In other words, he told us to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, the deaf. I came to the conclusion that Jesus likes to invite people to dine with him. Many miracles and many parables in the Bible revolve around food or meals. Matthew 22, Jesus spoke to them again by parable saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servant to call those who were invited to the wedding, but they would not come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited. See, I've prepared my supper. My oxen and fattened calves are killed and everything is ready. Come, come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and they went their ways. And one of his farm, and, and one to his farm, another went to his business. The rest took his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. When the king heard about it, he was angry, he sent his army, and he destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the streets and invite to the wedding banquet as many as you find. So those servants went out into the streets and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Verse 11, but when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man who was not wearing a wedding garment. He said to him, friend, how did you get in here without your wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king told the, the attendants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. My friend, did you know that for the first 400 years of the Christian church, churches in every city invited people to dinner on Saturday nights. They called it the agape feast, which means the love meal. We Christians invented the potluck dinner concept. Every, everybody brought something to church to share. Now, church meetings were held in homes. They didn't have church buildings the first 400 years. That was like putting a target. I mean, they, 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 they were killing Christians the first 400 years. But what they would do is they would gather in a home for church on Saturday night. The wealthier members of the congregation spent money from their own pockets to make sure that there was plenty of food on the table every Saturday night for whoever in the town came to hear the gospel of the kingdom. Now, let's put this in context here in the USA. 
There are over 300,000 local Christian congregations in America. So what would happen if every local church in America had dinner ready every Saturday night for whoever in their city desired to come and eat all the food that they wanted to eat and then stay and hear the gospel of the kingdom? How long would it take until the entire city was saved for Jesus Christ? What would happen if every Christian invited unsaved people in their neighborhood to their homes for lunch or dinner every weekend? How long until everybody in your neighborhood hears the gospel and most of them get saved? Yes, Matthew 24 is about the last days. There will be earthquakes, famines, and pestilences. Hatred of Christians will grow. We will be betrayed by our closest friends and even family members. The focus of Matthew 24, however, is not natural calamities and persecutions. It's not about the rapture and escaping these things coming to the earth. Matthew 24 is about being ready, and being ready includes serving the right meal at the right time. When church congregations corporately and individually invite the unsaved to meals for free, it will cost them money. The bigger the banquet, the bigger the cost to the host. Matthew 24 is about your money. Are you willing? Are you eager to spend your money to sponsor free meals for the unsaved to hear the gospel? Tomorrow, we will look at Matthew 25. There are three parables in Matthew 25 about the last days and the second coming of Jesus. All three involve spending money to be ready for the Lord's return. Come back tomorrow for Morning Manna. Please share this online Bible class on social media. Give a slice of manna bread to your friends on Facebook and Twitter. Well, welcome to Morning Manna. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. My topic this week is end time preppers. It's a continuation of the lessons in December of last year titled Things You Can Do in the Last Days. Matthew 24 is the most well-known chapter in the Bible about the end times. And most people think it's all about wars, natural calamities, persecution, and tribulation. Well, yes, those things are mentioned. The core message is being ready for the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Matthew 24, Jesus tells us to be ready for his return. He told a parable about a rich master who came home to see if his servants were doing his will on his property. Jesus asked the question, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has made ruler over his household to give them food at the appointed time. Yesterday, I said, the church must return to its apostolic roots when home churches gathered weekly for the agape feast. Early Christians paid for dinners every week to feed souls three things, physical food, the word of God, and the flesh and blood of Jesus. The agape feast, the love meal, this model worked because Christians gathered in their homes with their neighbors to share the gospel with them. The bottom line is this. They invested their money into sharing the gospel of the kingdom. They invested their money into feeding their neighbors with both food on the table and the spiritual word of God. The 24th and 25th chapters of the gospel of our Lord, according to St. Matthew, are really about money. Are we investing our personal money into the kingdom of God or are we consuming it on ourselves? There are three parables about the last days in chapter 25. All three are about being ready for the second coming of Jesus. And all three are about how and where you spend your money. Chapter 25 is a continuation of Jesus's answer to the question asked by his disciples, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming 
and of the end of the world. Jesus gave a long reply. It fills chapter 24 and chapter 25. So let's start with the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be like ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. But the wise took jars of oil with their lamps. While the bridegroom delayed, they all rested and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, look, the bridegroom is coming, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. The wise answered, no, lest there not be enough for us and you. Go rather to those who sell it and buy some for yourself. Verse 10, but while they went to buy some, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the son of man is coming. Now, clearly, this parable is about the kingdom of God. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven shall be like ten virgins. Now, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same entity. And don't believe anybody who teaches that there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. You want to know where that, you want to know where that false teaching originated? It comes from dipsyism dispensational, premillennial, pre-tribulation Zionism. The Dipsyites need two kingdoms to make their twisted Zionist-centric theology work. They teach that the kingdom of God is for the Jews and the kingdom of heaven is for Gentiles. That's not true. The parable of ten virgins is about people being ready for the return of Jesus Christ to establish his everlasting kingdom. There were 10 virgins waiting on the arrival of the bridegroom for the wedding. The parable is not about saved people and unsaved people. All 10 represent people expecting the bridegroom to come for the wedding. Therefore, it represents people who claim to be Christians who are waiting for the second coming of Jesus. All 10 took their lamps to go meet the bridegroom. The parable doesn't say five virgins went to meet the bridegroom and five virgins stayed home and missed the big event. It does say that five were wise and five were foolish. So what distinguishes the five wise virgins apart from the five foolish virgins? All ten took their lamps, but only five took oil with them. That's the difference between the two groups. Now, the standard teaching that I've heard all my life is that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. I'm sure you've heard the same thing. And that's the only thing I've ever known. But I now respectfully disagree with that teaching. I'll give you two reasons why I think the oil can't represent the Holy Spirit. The first reason that the oil is not the Holy Spirit is in verses 7 through 9. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. But the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. The wise answered, no, lest there not be enough for us and you. Go rather to those and sell it and buy some for yourselves. Well, the foolish virgins had no oil. The wise virgins had oil. If the oil represented the Holy Spirit, a paraphrase of the scripture would say, but the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your Holy Spirit. And the wise answered, no, lest there not be enough Holy Spirit for both of us. Well, how can the Holy Spirit diminish by sharing the Holy Spirit with others? The Holy Spirit doesn't shrink up, and dry up and, and wither away when you share him with others. The oil can't represent the Holy Spirit. Now, the second reason 
the oil cannot represent the Holy Spirit is in verse 9. The wise answered, no, lest there not be enough for us and you. Go rather to those who sell it and buy some for yourselves. Do you see it? Sell it. Well, can you purchase the Holy Spirit? Can you buy some Holy Spirit? Let's look at the book of Acts, chapter 8, starting in verse 9. We read about a man named Simon. He was a sorcerer. He practiced witchcraft. He had a huge following of people in Samaria who were just blown away by the power of his sorcery. Simon, however, heard Philip preaching the gospel of the kingdom one day in Samaria. Simon believed and was baptized into the church. And he continued to follow Philip, and he was just amazed as he watched the miracles and signs that were done through Philip. Now, starting in verse 14, Acts chapter 8 says, The apostles sent Peter and John to Samaria when the news reached Jerusalem that people were receiving the Holy Spirit in Samaria. When Simon, the former sorcerer, saw that the Holy Spirit came upon believers, When the apostles laid their hands on them, he offered money to the apostles and he said, give me also this power that whomever I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, how did Apostle Peter respond to the proposition to sell him some Holy Spirit? Verse 20 through 23 says that Peter said to him, may your money perish with you because you thought you could purchase the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor share in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of your wickedness and ask God if perhaps the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me that nothing you have spoken may come upon me. Now, here's the point I'm making. You can't purchase the Holy Spirit. You cannot purchase the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Such thoughts are gross sins. If the oil does not represent the Holy Spirit in the parable of the ten virgins, what does it represent? Well, I've learned that when you have questions about things in the Bible, the best place to find the answers is in the Bible. The Bible answers its own questions. All ten virgins, wise and foolish, had lamps. So what's the purpose or the function of a lamp. A lamp supplies light. When you are walking in darkness, you need a lamp to provide light so you see where you're going. You need a lamp so that you don't stumble and trip over something and fall down in the darkness. Psalm 119 verse 105 gives us the answer. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible says God's holy word is our lamp to provide light unto our path through life. The lamps in the hands of the ten virgins represents the Holy Bible. This book right here, the word of God. Matthew 25, 6 says, while the bridegroom delayed, they all rested and slept. Now, Christians in every generation, since the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, have anticipated the second coming of Jesus. But the Lord has delayed his return now for over 2,000 years, and nobody knows the hour nor the day of his return. When the bridegroom delayed his, his arrival, all 10 virgins fell asleep and rested. When did the bridegroom appear? It was at midnight. It was late. It was dark. Everybody was asleep. But there was a shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. My friend, we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, we're not going to be flown to heaven for eternity. Instead, we meet in the air the conquering king, and we escort him back to earth to bring justice. The wicked shall be bundled and burned. Yes, there will be a shout. Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 16, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend with heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, 
and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Matthew 25 verse 7 says, Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. Now what does it mean to trim your lamp? To trim your lamp means to get it ready. Get it ready to function. What's the function of a lamp? It's to produce light. All ten virgins jumped up out of bed when they heard the shout. They immediately grabbed their lamps and they started to trim the lamps. Verse 8 says, But the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. Meaning there's no light. What's the light? The word of God. The foolish virgins had no light. They did not have the word of God in their lives. All ten were caught by surprise, by the lateness of the bridegroom's arrival. It came at the dark midnight hour. But five had the word of God in their hearts. Five had the word of the world in their hearts. Five could see their way through the darkness to meet the bridegroom. Five walked in the darkness and stumbled and fell. God's holy word was not a lamp unto their feet. The parable of the ten virgins is about having light. The light is the word of God. It guides your feet through life. You must invest in oil to produce light. What are you monetarily investing in these days? Where's your money going? How much money are you investing into the kingdom of God to possess more light? Five foolish virgins took their lamps, but no oil. Today, it would be like taking a flashlight without batteries. It's useless in the dark. The bridegroom arrived at the midnight hour. Five were not ready because they had no light. They had no light because they had no oil. They had no oil because they were unwilling to make necessary investments in acquiring oil to produce light. Now, as a pastor, I see two groups of Christians these days. One group casually goes through life, never pressing in to get more of God's Holy Spirit, never investing in whatever it takes to have more light in their lives, never investing in the gospel, never investing in knowing the word of God. Now, the other group, however, is always pressing in, seeking more of God, always hungering for more light in their lives, always investing in the kingdom to spread the light to others. Big difference between the two groups. It costs money to buy Bibles and Bible study guides. It costs money to purchase anointed books about God's kingdom. It costs money to travel to church in your neighborhood multiple times each week. It costs money to send your children and teens to church events. It costs money to travel to attend Bible conferences, workshops, seminars. Hey, it costs money to pursue truth. Truth is free, but you got to spend something to get to it. Five virgins showed up with no light because they had no oil. They had no oil because their money was still in their wallets and their purses and their bank accounts. Still sitting in their banks. They never invested it in the kingdom. It was too late. They were caught by surprise. The foolish virgin said to the wise, give us your oil <clears throat> so that we have light. But the wise answered, no, there won't be enough for us and you. You go get some yourself. But while they went to get oil, to get light, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. There we are again, a banquet, Jesus feeding people. But the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. And he said, get out of here. I don't know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. My friend, chapter 24 and chapter 25 in the gospel according to St. Matthew are about your money. Where are you investing your money? How much are you willing to spend to acquire more light? How much are you willing to spend to share the light with others who are still 
in the darkness. Thanks for watching Morning Manna. Come back tomorrow and I'll tell you about the parable of the talents. And yes, it's about money too. I love you. Be sure. To well, welcome to Morning Manna. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our topic is end time preppers. I've been talking about Matthew chapters 24 and 25. Both chapters are a long reply that Jesus gave his disciples when they asked him the sign of his second coming and the end of the world. I think all of us have been focusing on the natural calamities, wars, apostasy, and persecution that's in chapter 24. Instead, we should focus on the central theme in both chapters. We must be ready for his return. Preppers are people who wisely store physical things to survive almost any calamity or situation. Preparation's a good thing. In addition to stockpiling food, supplies, precious metals, and self-defense items, we must also, and more importantly, stockpile the Word of God in our hearts. And we must also invest our funds in helping others to become spiritually ready for the Lord's return. Whether you like it or not, the parables in chapter 24 and 25 are about where and how we spend our money. Today, we will study the parable of the talents. Let's read Matthew 25. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he, had, and he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, verse 24. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you, did, where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, unfortunately, many Christians privately think that God is after their money. The truth is just the opposite. Your heavenly father isn't trying to take money from you. He's desiring to get money to you and through you. If you don't understand the through you part of that sentence, you're missing 
the spiritual meaning of this talent, this parable of the talents. You and I are his hands, feet, and mouth on earth. He functions through us. Yes, God has the power to literally make money grow on trees for us, but he's not going to do it. That would violate his laws of the universe. God has an economy. Satan has an economy. When we leave the kingdom of darkness of this world and are born again and baptized into the kingdom of God, we leave Satan's economic system and we enter into God's kingdom where we must learn to operate and prosper in God's economic system on earth. Satan's system is based on greed. God's system is based on generosity. Why? Because both systems reflect the values of their masters, God or Satan. Now, you can spiritualize uh, the parable of the talents all you want, but I truly believe it's about money, how we spend the money, how we invest the money, what we do with the money. The talents in this parable do not refer to gifting, skills, and natural abilities. In fact, he said he gave the talents based on their abilities. It doesn't mean talents like you know how to sing and dance. This parable is about your money. It's about what you do with your money. Who are the actors in this story? Well, there's a rich ruler and there are three servants. The rich man appointed each of them the three servants, as stewards of his money. A steward is a person who manages another person's or another entity's financial affairs and property. A steward acts as an agent on behalf of another person or entity and has a fiduciary responsibility to make wise decisions regarding the money or property of the person who owns it. For example, a trustee is a steward of a trust appointed to wisely and properly manage the assets of the trust on behalf of the donor of the trust, which is the settler. In this parable, all three men were appointed as trustees of the rich man's wealth. The first two men wisely invested the money that they were entrusted with by the rich man. The rich man congratulated them for their wise handling of his affairs. They didn't lose the investment capital, and indeed, both trustees made a profit. They doubled the money for the rich man, and he was pleased with them, and he promised both of them a reward. Now, the third guy did not earn the rich man's praise. He said, I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Now, I know what I'm going to say. This may be an over-spiritualization but I want you to at least ponder this possible explanation. You and I are made from the dust of the earth. From dust we come to dust we go. God made us from dust of the earth. So when we die, they put us back into the earth, into the dust, into the earth, into the ground we go. When the third servant said he hid the talent in the ground, was he saying I spent it on myself, perhaps. But one thing I do know is that all of us will face a day of reckoning. Now, interestingly, reckoning is an accounting term. It means the settlement of accounts between two parties. It's a financial statement as for things received or done. You and I will give God an account on Judgment Day. And here on earth, whenever somebody cheats me or wrongs me, I always, well, I, I try always. It's not always easy, all right? But I do my best to smile and say, God's books are always balanced. And by that, I mean, I'm going to let God get revenge on that person for whatever they did to me. I'm not going to do it. I'll let the Lord do it. At the end of the day, the Lord's books will be balanced and he will collect from you or whoever he needs to collect from whatever is due to balance his books. So don't cheat people. Don't wrong people. 
God will collect. He'll balance his books. There will be a day in this world you're going to pay for what you did. Now, the third steward was afraid of the rich man. He described the rich man as, as harsh and cruel. Well, why didn't the other two men describe the rich man as harsh and cruel? They prospered, but it was not in a spirit of fear. The third man had a religious spirit. He sees God as a hard, mean, demanding person. The other two men see God as loving, caring, and generous, and they desired to be like him. Many sincere, devout Christians are financially hindered in this life by erroneous doctrines and beliefs about God and money. They could know their father if they could just leave their doctrines behind and then press in and develop a close personal relationship with their heavenly father. The parable of the talents is about money. It isn't your money. It is God's money. You and I don't own a thing. We are stewards of God's assets. We manage his wealth on earth on behalf of his kingdom. Do you have any investments? I'm talking about real investments. Are you earning a return on your money that God has put in your hands? Or are you too afraid to make investments? Well, losing money in a bad investment isn't a sin. Fear of losing money in a bad investment is the sin. It is impossible to fail when you are sincerely seeking to please God. So don't have fear. Step out in faith. Thanks for watching Morning Manna. Well, welcome to Morning Manna. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our theme this week has been end time preppers, and we've been studying Matthew chapter 25. So far, we've read the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents. Now, I got to say this. I must be hitting a raw nerve in some of you, judging by the reaction I'm getting. Why would you react in a negative way about this, this series? Well, it's because I'm saying that the central message in chapters 24 and 25 are, number one, we must be spiritually ready for the Lord's return. Well, that's not that controversial, is it? Number two, we must invest our money into pursuing God. Yes, it will cost you something to pursue God and expand his kingdom on earth. Now, we're starting to get to the core of it, aren't we? And number three, we must invest our money in helping others to be spiritually ready for the Lord's return. Maybe that's what's upsetting people. Well, some of the uncomfortable folks are saying that I'm begging for money on Morning Manna, and you know that's not true. You can go back this week and watch every episode of Morning Manna, and I never ask you for a dollar. I did say, however, that God will hold you and me accountable for the way that we handle his money in relation to his kingdom. And that is what's making some of you squirm and squeal. Some of you are twisting my words and accusing me of saying things I did not say simply because this week's morning manna messages are making you feel uncomfortable. And you know what? That's called conviction. And that's what I'm paid to do. So I'm going to do some more of it today. The last section of chapter 25 is really tough for most Christians to swallow because it's not taught in most modern churches. Keep in mind that all of chapter 25 is a continuation of Jesus' long reply to a question asked him at the top of chapter 24. Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Let's read Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats 
on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty. You gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. I was naked. You did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, let's examine this scripture. When Jesus Christ returns. All the angels are with him. That means no angels are back home in heaven. He's going to empty the house back home. All the nations shall be gathered. That means every nation that has existed since the days after the great flood. Nations that we people in this modern age never even knew existed in ancient times. Every nation will be reconstituted. How? Well, all the graves shall be opened when Jesus Christ returns. The graves of the righteous and the graves of the wicked. Now, I got to stop right here and I got to tell you something. That's not what the Dipsyites teach. They teach that Jesus is coming back to give the Jews their kingdom in the Middle East so they can rule the world for a thousand years. They teach that the wicked are judged after their so-called 1,000-year-long Jewish kingdom. Well, what does the Bible say? It says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations. That's the end of the discussion right there, folks. The Word of God is easy to understand. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in His glory... If all the nations in the history of mankind are reconstituted, it's because all the graves are open when he returns. Now, it's in the word. John 5, verses 25 through 29 clearly tells us that the Christian Zionists are wrong. There will not be two resurrections, just like there won't be two second comings. All the graves are open when Jesus returns. And he doesn't return twice. That's another Christian Zionist heresy. They teach he comes back secretly in a rapture for the Christians and then returns seven years later. What does John 5 verses 25 through 29 say? Truly, truly. That's double truly. That means this is really true, folks. I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in him, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all, when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection 
of judgment. Now, what does that say? All the graves open, the righteous and the wicked, when Jesus Christ returns. At the return of Jesus, every human who's ever lived on this planet will be brought out of the graves and placed into the nation in which he or she belonged when they were alive. We will be judged individually and corporately. And when I say corporately, I'm referring to our nation. Yes, we will be held accountable for our nation's sins and rebellion. And that's why I preach repentance. I don't want my country, America. I don't want America's bloody wars, abortions, sexual immorality, and sorcery to stain my soul. Now, the Bible says that the Lord Jesus will sort out the people and group them into two categories, sheep and goats. And you don't want to be, I mean, you want to be in the sheep group because the goats will be barbecued in hell for eternity. When Jesus returns, everybody, and everybody means everybody, will be asked the same question. The sheep will be asked the same question presented to the goats. What did you do? In the name of Jesus Christ for the poor, the hungry, the naked, the lonely, the sick, the imprisoned. Notice that Jesus won't ask us, did you stand for Israel? My friend, the sheep are true Israel. It has nothing to do with your race. True Israel are the people who love and worship God in spirit and truth through his son, Jesus Christ. So don't let the Zionists steal your identity in Christ. You and I will be asked by Jesus if we fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the sick, the imprisoned, the lonely. And folks, it costs money to do these things. You just try doing it without money. Tell me if it works. Do you see what I'm teaching in this week's lessons? I'm not trying to get you to give money to us. I'm trying to get you to see what the Word of God is teaching us. The core messages in chapters 24 and 25 are, I'm going to repeat it. Number one, we must be spiritually ready for the Lord's return. Number two, we must invest our money into pursuing God. And pursuing God and expanding His kingdom on earth requires an expenditure of money. You must travel to church services. You've got to get your children and your teenagers involved in church events, conferences, summer camps. You must buy books and DVDs to be taught the Word of God. You've got to travel to attend seminars and conferences to hear the Word of God preached and taught. Now, you can live in a, like a hermit in a hobbit house if you want to, but you're not going to grow spiritually, and you're not going to impact anybody else in a positive way for the kingdom of God. We must invest our money into helping others be spiritually ready for the Lord's return. You and I can't do one thing to halt, block, mitigate, or lessen the calamities, the wars, the apostasy, the persecution that will come to us as described in chapter 24 of the gospel of our Lord according to St. Matthew. We must, however, be spiritually ready for the Lord's return. And we must invest our money, our time, our energy into helping others be ready for the Lord's return. We are commanded to serve meat in due season. It means the right meal at the right time. We must preach and teach the right spiritual nourishment at the appropriate time before the Lord returns. We must invite the lost into our homes and churches and feed them. You feed them with physical food and the word of God and the flesh and the blood of our Savior. In the parable of the ten virgins, we see that we must invest money in having oil in our lamps. Our lamps provide light. The light is the Word of God. The lamp lamp is the Word of God that provides light so that we do not stumble in the darkness at the midnight hour when the bridegroom appears. In the parable of the talents, we see that we must wisely invest the Lord's money and resources to produce a return for him. What kind of return does God desire on his resources? One thing, souls. That's 
the return he wants. You and I don't own a thing in this world. Your salary, your house, your car, your truck, your business, your clothes, your stuff, it all belongs to God. You don't own any of it. He's appointed you as a steward of his resources. And we must not hide it in the dirt. That is, spend it only on ourselves by wisely investing our resources and making them grow. We spend the increase on expanding the kingdom of God. That's what the Lord expects of all of us. And lastly, we must feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the lonely, the sick, the imprisoned. It's not an option. It's not a choice. It's a commandment. If you aren't doing it, you need to get busy. And let me tell you, I'm preaching to myself too. All of us need to examine our lives. How will we answer those questions when Jesus returns? I hope this week's morning manna has challenged you to study the Bible and pray to God for enlightenment about this message. Thanks for watching and be sure to watch True News.